Hello, everybody. And uh, uh, as the kind moderator has introduced, this is a session about storytelling. I'm going to talk about in the past three years in the government how we forked the government. And along the way, I'll explain what fork means. It probably doesn't mean what you think it means. And in any case, uh, I welcome interactions. So at any point, if you think I'm talking too fast or uh, it's very interesting, it's too boring, please just let, let me know with your visual expressions or with, with raising your hand. And uh, at the end of each story, uh, we'll pause briefly and feel free to just raise your hand and have the microphone and we can engage in some dialogue. Uh, so without further ado, uh, my name is Audrey Tang. I'm usually the open source civic hacker. Uh, now the word open source just means that I relinquish, I abandon my copyright to all the work that I do, uh, programming, text, art, poetry, whatever, and in the hope that people can take whatever that I have created and take it maybe to a different direction, maybe to the better, and in whatever way they like. Uh, civic just means that I care about the society, and hacker just means that when I face with a new situation, I try to make new tools instead of fitting old tools to solve new problems. Uh, it may or may not be illegal. This is not today's subject. And uh, I started working in the IT career uh, as an interpreter in 1994. So after working for 20 years, I have retired uh, in 2013. And uh, after my retirement, I joined this um, voluntary sector, which is very uh, active in Taiwan. There's a lot of people donating their time, donating their intelligence, just for the public good, without the public and private sector's uh, restrictions. But on the other hand, when we're working on third sector uh, projects, because we abandon our copyright, anybody in the first and the second sector is welcome to take those uh, products and make interesting applications on their own. For example, I still work with Apple uh, because they use my computational linguistic libraries to make Siri. And for example, um, People Fluent, the Oxford University Press, and the National Development Council. Now, in the third sector, um, why am I retired this early, and why do I donate all my time working for the public good? Um, so uh, I first learned programming when I was eight years old in 1989. Uh, when I first got my first computer and learned programming, my father visited Beijing for the first time. Uh, and when he was in Beijing, that was in May, and he ran into this massive student protest. Some of you may still remember, it's called the Tiananmen Square incident. Um, he returned to Taiwan on June the 1st. Very fortunate, otherwise I may not have a father anymore, right? And, and on June the 4th, uh, a, the Tiananmen uh, massacre uh, appeared. After the Tiananmen massacre, uh, my father, uh, who's a pol political science uh, scholar, uh, changed his subject to study uh, on the student movements in Beijing. So he pursued his PhD in Ger Germany, where a lot of exiles, people who cannot return to Beijing anymore, come to the Europe for their further education. So when I come to Germany to study with my father, I was 11 years old at that time, uh, I found young people who are very much pro-democratization, but they cannot return to their homeland anymore. So I, was, I grew up among those activists, and we keep debating what is the best way to further democracy in an oppressive regime. I returned to Taiwan in 1994, three actually, and uh, on 94, uh, just when I was about to enroll into the junior high school, there was a very important invention in the human history. It's called the World Wide Web by Sir Tim Burns Lee. Web for the first time that I found that I can connect to researchers just like you over the web who are pioneers in their respective fields. And because perhaps the web was so young, people were very enthusiastic to share their developments, their research, and engage in dialogue with just a 13-year-old uh, over the web. So I quit school because I discovered that uh, if I have to learn of your creations in the normal school system, I'll have to wait for 10 years for it to enter the curriculum, for it to enter into the textbook, and so on. But for the first time over the web, people can interact with each other in a ways that defies the original, you know, top-down kind of model of communication. 
So basically, I learned everything from the web based on the grateful, uh, graceful sharing of people who want to share with just anybody. Because I learned so much from the web, I also want to give back. So for the next 20 years, I joined the free software movement, uh, later also known as the open source movement, and I work on various projects that facilitate safe spaces so people can learn from each other and iterate toward actionable ideas. Uh, the, the project in the middle, uh, Wikipedia, is perhaps more well known, but um, all those projects are furthering the same value uh, that of the application of technology. So uh, I've been working with uh, Liu Jiahua, who's uh, responsible for the public deliberation over the sunflower movement occupied last year. And uh, she always says that behind every technologist, there should be more. There should be a set of values informing technology's pursuit. So my values are, uh, just as the previous slides say, just iterating and learning from each other toward actionable ideas. So three years ago, when GovZero, the movement, first started, there's this cynicism uh, among the, the web-enabled people around the potentials of Facebook or social media uh, on civic participation. Uh, in Taiwan, there's a very famous writer called Zhang Dachun uh, who writes about uh, politics all the time on Facebook, and there's huge numbers of likes. But when the magazine Wired interviewed Zhang Dachun asking, will Facebook be a catalyst for civic participation? John said, no, I feel as if they have participated because clicking a like is one second, clicking a share is 10 seconds, clicking a comment maybe one minute, and over one minute, whenever John Dachun calls his readers for action, people just switch to cat videos. They just do something else. They, they never respond to anything uh, real and actionable. So John Dachun concludes that his readers are lazy, or at least lazy when they're browsing Facebook. And uh, he cannot think of a way that engage them in So if one have to summarize Gov Zero, the movement, in one sentence, is that we keep inventing ways, in practical ways, that allow lazy people to engage in real action. Now, case study. This is a, I'm sure that everybody knows what a CAPTCHA is. I don't have to explain it. <clears throat> a CAPTCHA is a way to test that you're not a robot by asking you to fill in um, some optical character recognition. So it's like a game that everybody knows how to play. So last year, we set up this game that asked people to type in those numbers <clears throat> along with other people. But what are those numbers? Those are the public finance records of all the elections um, in, the, in the Taiwan's past. There's this building called the Jian Cha Yuan, the corrective Yuan, uh, responsible for auditing the parliament and the executive uh, for all their elections, for their public uh, campaign records, and so on. But the old laws, the old regulations that allows people to get copies of those uh, audit records says you can only get it in Xerox copies, that is to say in paper. And also, you have to walk into this single building in Taipei to get paper. So it is not very friendly. And the result is that the only the corrective UN gets to, the, to do the auditing. Everybody else, all the citizens, can only just you know, press some calculators and to make sure that their addition, their sum is correct. That is about all that we can do. So a writer, uh, Feng Guangyuan, uh, started this project asking people to you know, just digitize uh, these hard copies and publish them on the web in a way of civic sort of disobedience. And now the corrective union will surely say, and they did say, that you cannot guarantee 100% correctness uh, when you publish things this way. And then we can say back to the corrective union, okay, so you publish it, you have the 100% data. So this is this kind of, you know, the sun and the north wind kind of tactics. But if we copy out this A4 uh, paper copies and we type them down into a spreadsheet, it would take five minutes per paper. I, I tried it. The problem is that, as John Dutton correctly observed, when you ask people to donate more than one minute of their attention, of their time, they switch to cat videos. So what we did is that we split them into dofu, five-sized tasks so that people can just spend five seconds of their time and still feel that they're saving the country. And it worked. We applied uh, well-known principles of gamification 
that allows people to see how many people are around doing the same thing. And we run a progress bar, and we have a countdown on how many uh, digitization records there's yet to do. And because this is a successful gamification, people just engaged in a real interesting way. They stay up all night, taking 24 hours. And we have very interesting call to actions and so on. So that the first batch, huge numbers of you know, 300,000 campaign finance records uh, is digitized by 9,700 contributors uh, into digitization records, and each cell has at least three people looking at it and two of them agreeing. So uh, with near 10,000 contributors, this is what we call the OCR, Otaku Character Recognition, meaning that we harness the power of otakus, of nerds, of geeks, of people who just swipe on their Facebook with extra attention, cognitive surplus, to do OCR. So now, when we have the digitization records of the campaign finance, we can do a lot of things. This is the raw data, and this is not um, specific to a legislator. For any legislator, uh, we can have uh, their income, their spendings, how it correlates their stock um, portfolio, how it connects to uh, their um, construction uh, budget recommendations, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of analysis. So one year ago, uh, we have this voting guide project from GovZero that let everybody see their uh, election candidates on the mayoral and the township level so that people can make informed choice based on the actual factual performance of their politicians. And we also see that how many campaign they require from their own parties, from the Blue Party, from the Green Party, and of course, legislator Yan Qingbiao, who doesn't need much money for any of the parties, he's very rich, and so on. So uh, we have interesting analysis. Now, the same uh, crowdsourcing platform has been used after that for many, many different times. We use a crowdsourced bookmarks during the Kaohsiung gas explosion, during the Baxian uh, explosion. There's a lot of disasters here, uh, but um, this one you might have heard about, this is the Nepal earthquake. We worked with the OpenStreetMap team uh, on the humanitarian OpenStreetMap um, effort to popularize this idea of splitting a map to different squares so that people can identify buildings and roads from the satellite images. And this is the first time that we got the satellite image 24 hours after the disaster so that we can compare the before and after so that the humanitarian aids can use the up-to-date information to deliver um, their supplies. So in each case of those Gov Zero projects, it's actually three different kinds of people joining to make something happen. First, we have those popular writers, bloggers, civic media, including Zhang Chun, Feng Guangyuan, and later on, Hao Mingyi. They were all people with enormous influence. Whenever they post a Facebook, post a blog, a lot of people see, and not many people take action. So over time, they, they, they think it's impossible. They, they become cynic, like they don't have this connection to the hands-on community. But through Gov Zero, which is a space, they connect to the social activists who are very much willing to do the hands-on work, such as work walking into the Corrective UN and coming up with a lot of A4 uh, copies. Now, on the other hand, these people are not connected to the free software people. In and the social activists, in particular, are not very much used to working with strangers. They thought, you know, maybe with 10,000 strangers, People will sabotage us, maybe there will be a lot of errors, and so on and so forth. And it is our uh, goal as a community to convince them that it is okay. The SWIFT trust model works nowadays, and people can trust strangers to do the work as long as you have the sufficient uh, check and balances in place. What is GovZero really? Uh, it is a space or a series of spaces. On the physical world, we are just a bunch of hackathons. Now, I have explained hackers are people who make new tools, and hackathon means a hacker's marathon, meaning that people just work to one day or for two days without stop. So GovZero doesn't actually maintain any money whatsoever. For each hackathon, we take public contributions, just a few hundred dollars, uh, that is corresponding <clears throat> to the food and the coffee that's needed for the event, and that's it. And the good thing about not taking anybody's money is that we're inclusionary. Because if you take anybody's money, they may want to ask you to exclude something. 
So when you participate in our uh, bi-monthly hackathon, the first thing you see is a lot of stickers. And you can just take those stickers. For example, you're good at science, at photography, at design, at law, and then put them on the badge over your shoulder. And if you're first time here, you take a deer, and you're, if you have been here many times, you take a Taiwan black bag. So what, what are those stickers for? For the first uh, hour of the hackathon, early in the morning, people pitch for their ideas. Usually, there's about 20 different teams pitching for their ideas. For example, people may want to do the open finance, people want to do a recall platform to recall uh, legislators, people may want to do all sorts of things. And now, when they're pitching their ideas, we ask them to write down specifically, maybe they want two designers, two coders, one storyteller, and one law people, or something like that. And so after everybody declared their human requirement, we play musical chairs, in the sense that people just walk toward the project they're interested at, but if you see a you know, redundancy in a certain project, then you walk to some other project, so that we ensure that each project have more or less the same amount of people devoting their attention to it. Now people started working the entire day, and by the end of the day, usually they have something to present, a prototype, a mock-up, a sketch-up, or maybe even a working website. Now they take the stage, five minutes for each project, and they declare that they are now meeting online, or meeting every week, or every twice a week, or something, to make this project a completion. So the thing is that Gov Zero is not a group, it's not an organization, it's just a space. Anybody who enters the space becomes a participator, and everybody who contributes their time and energy into a project becomes a contributor. And they uh, know more people and participate in more events, and we have smaller hackathons every other month, and then even smaller hackathons, maybe 10 or 20 people every weekend, so that people uh, like designers and lawyers and so on teach uh, each of the other groups, their uh, field and their trade. So it's like a learning community. Now we've been running this for three years. And our mantra, so to speak, is worse is better. Uh, the thing is that working with open source means that you must be comfortable of just publishing things that look ugly, the things that are incomplete, things that are just imperfect, things that are just plain bad. So, for example, this is the first, the Zero's, uh, Gov Zero logo. I'm pretty sure that everybody here can design a better logo than this. It is very, very difficult to think of an uglier logo than this. But in any case, two brilliant programmers, absolutely sucks at designing logos, um, just hang this at the Academia Sinica at the Zero's Gov Zero hackathon as the Gov Zero logo. Now, a designer, a pretty famous visual designer, attended the hackathon and just see this and becomes very upset. So upset that he declares that he cannot do anything without just changing this very ugly logo. So this is what we in Taiwan say, you can upset a designer with just a picture. So he spends an entire day just designing a better logo, like speaking and voting and like inspecting and so on. So this is obviously better. But because he donated also his copyright, so people can just freely change everything in it, uh, eventually we, because of the smaller screens on mobile phones, we set on a better visual design, that uh, more apparent, and so on. But without the first worse is better kind of donation of the first zeros uh, prototype, there's no follow-ups. So it takes a lot of courage at first. And I often say to Gov Zero people uh, that there's a famous uh, lyrics from my favorite singer, Leonard Cohen, that says, there is a crack in everything, and that is how the light gets in. So it is imperfect, and that is fine, because if it is perfect, you cannot make friends. If this is imperfect, you can make friends, you can learn from other people.